Okay, in this video today I'm going to be talking about two-dimensional motion, introducing some of the concepts from that. Um, and this will come from sections 3.1 and 3.3 of your textbook, so you should also be reading those. Alright, so so far we've talked about one-dimensional motion and had ideas of position, velocity, and acceleration, and now we're going to have similar ideas but generalized to 3D. So if we take, say, a position from one-dimensional motion, you can imagine that in, sorry, not 3D, but in 2D motion, you would have that position vector r, which would simply be equal to the um, x position um, in the i-hat direction plus the y position in the j-hat direction. The velocity vector, which was previously just the velocity in one dimension, um, would now be similarly v sub x i hat plus v sub y j hat. And then the acceleration, which was the acceleration vector in one, direct, in one dimension only, now would become the two-dimensional acceleration vector a sub x i hat plus a sub y j hat. Um, you should note, too, that if you ever have three-dimensional motion to analyze, then it's um, all, everything we discuss also applies to three-dimensional motion, and you would just add in the k-hat direction. Now, remember that the velocity is the rate change of the position, and that still applies here. And so what we have is that the velocity is going to be the rate change of the position, so dr dt. And then similarly, the acceleration is the rate change of the velocity, the time rate change. So the acceleration is going to be equal to dv dt. Now this is actually pretty interesting because if you note that you would have a non-zero acceleration even if the magnitude of your velocity stays the same. That is if the speed's not changing, but if the direction is changing. So if even if your direction of the vector is the only thing that's changing, you still have an acceleration. So let's make a note of that point. Um, so something is accelerating even if the only thing that changes about the velocity is the direction. So for example, um, when we get to section 3.4, we'll talk about circular motion. But just from this simple definition of the acceleration in two dimensions, you can see that something that is moving in a circle with a constant speed would certainly have a non-zero acceleration. Okay, um, if we go ahead now and add just another terminology for our related to our velocity, we would then note that the magnitude of that velocity vector um, is simply the speed. Right? and that you can then divide each of these into their components. And what will be important for our projectile motion quite a bit problems will be that you would have some velocity vector v, which then is divided into a velocity um, in the x direction and a velocity in the y direction. So all of these then can be divided into their components. Um, it turns out that um, it's not too difficult to solve problems in two-dimensional or even three-dimensional motion. It just becomes more algebraically difficult. But conceptually, it's not because um, you can actually analyze the motion as a superposition of two different motions, the x direction and the y direction. So a key point for two-dimensional motion or multi-dimensional motion is that you can analyze the motion as the superposition of two motions. And those two motions would be your x direction um, that would have then an acceleration um, a sub x. And the other motion would be the y direction, which would then have an acceleration of a sub y. And what's important is because these are orthogonal to each other, that is perpendicular to each other, um, that these are actually independent um, of each other. So when you work 
between these two, and we are, we'll see how this works out with our kinematics equations, um, the only thing that interchanges between the two is going to be the time t. So very frequently, when we're dealing with 2D motion, we're going to be in, um, we're going to end up talking about projectile motion. And projectile motion um, is another example um, of our term for free fall, um, where gravity is the only force that's acting. So what this means then um, is that we're going to have the acceleration vector is only in the y direction. So the acceleration vector is going to be equal um, to um, your ay um, term only. Now, if we go ahead and talk about it specifically um, for projectile motion, then we can see that the acceleration in the x direction is going to be zero. And then the acceleration, and I'll write it over here so we can make a table of equations below each one, in the y direction is going to be equal to negative 9.8 meters per second squared in our j direction. And so we can then actually write our kinematics equations um, using these. What we can first note in the x direction is that now all of a sudden there's no acceleration at all, which means that we have a constant velocity um, in the x direction, which actually simplifies things immensely um, because now we actually have one single equation that will apply for our x motion. And this will then make all of your problem solving much easier because in anything you can analyze in x, there's only one choice for the equation that can be used. And very simply, um, it's that if you have constant velocity motion, your position in x is equal to your initial position, x naught, plus the velocity in x times time. Where this is the constant velocity, right, vx is equal to a constant, and again, this is the only equation um, in the x direction. So the x motion is not accelerating. The velocity is a constant. So position as a function of time would then be linear. Now over here in the y direction, again remembering that these are independent of each other, um, we can write the equations based on the acceleration in that direction only. Um, then we can basically write down our kinematics equations um, for one-dimensional motion in the y direction. So I'm just going to write my kinematics equations, but now in terms of the y direction. So y is equal to y naught plus vy naught t plus one half ay t squared. Um, I also have that the velocity in the y direction at some time t is equal to the initial velocity v naught y plus a y t. And then I have that my position is equal to y naught plus one half v y naught um, plus v y times t and v y squared is equal to v y naught squared plus 2ay times my displacement y minus y naught. And so now we have these four equations, which we're fairly comfortable with having used them in one dimension. And the difference now um, is that we've added in something that's moving also at constant velocity in the x direction. Now note for these two equations here that the time um, is the same time for both. So that is something then that sometimes if you need, say for example, something in the x direction, um, if you need v sub x 
and you know, say, your displacement, well, you would need to get the time because you would have two unknowns and one equation, and that's a problem. So what you do is you go to the y direction and then you try to get time. And so the time can then interchange between the two. All right, so given that we have then these sets of equations, and when we talk about the motion being independent, what we have in the x direction, we have the constant velocity motion. Let me draw a line here, constant velocity motion. So let's to me just sort of depict this like that. And then in the y direction, um, we have, you know, one dimensional free fall. So I'm going to just draw that, say, as you go up and then something comes back down. And so if you now imagine that you're taking the superposition of these two, so that you're just adding them together. So imagine that you're throwing a ball up and down, right? So you throw a ball up and then it comes back down. But now imagine that you're doing it in a car that's moving at a constant speed. So if you imagine throwing your ball up and down and then moving in a car at a constant speed and somebody on the ground watching that ball, what they would see is basically the superposition of those two motions, which then ends up being parabolic. So you get this parabolic motion from your up and down and then how far it moves along the x direction with that constant speed. Okay, so because it's parabolic motion, um, it's going to be symmetric. Um, so that if you have level ground and you have this parabolic motion, then that tells you that the time to the top equals the time to the bottom. So the time on the way up is going to be equal to the time on the way down. Further, the speed here is going to be equal to the final speed right before it strikes the ground. So those are some useful tools that you can use during problem solving. Another thing that's useful to think about with the parabolic motion has to do with the time of flight. And the time of flight depends on how high it goes. So the y direction only. And so if we try to understand this, let's take sort of a simple case that's often talked about, which would be imagine dropping one ball off a table straight down from rest. And then imagine shooting another ball at the same time in a horizontal motion and then having it fall to the ground. So if the one that is shot horizontally, it's important to note then that the initial velocity in the y direction is still equal to zero, just like the one that was dropped vertically. So these have um, the same y components um, for all their motion. That is, they have the same y naught, they have the same y final, which would be at the ground, they have the same v y naught, um, and they would even have, therefore, the same final velocity in the y direction, not in the x direction, because this one clearly has an x component, but this one does not. Um, and, of course, they have the same acceleration due to gravity. So if we look at this equation, y is equal to y naught plus v y naught t plus one half a y t squared, we can see then that because all of these quantities here um, are going to be the same, that the time will be the same. Which means that these balls would strike the ground at the same time if this occurred um, and they were launched together. And this is something that we'll do in class. You can take it further and this, this um, discussion further, and you can then talk about, say, two balls that are launched with different speeds and angles but reach the same height. If they reach the same height, they have the same time of flight. 
And again, you can think about this by looking at the time it takes them to go from the top to the bottom. So if we call this here our y naught, then they would have the same y naught. They have the same y naught. They have the same v y naught, which equals zero because at the top the initial, I mean, sorry, the velocity in the y direction is zero, and they have the same acceleration. So if the acceleration, the v y naught, and the y naught are the same, then that tells us that the time depends on where they land. And so assuming it's the level ground, then that's going to be the same amount. So you can make the, the case that one that goes higher has a higher why not, and therefore it's going to have to have a longer time of flight. Okay, that um, is going to conclude this introduction to chapter three material, and we will discuss this more in class. As always, let me know if you have any questions.